silkworm larvae, like here, are a popular food for reptiles and are commonly shipped out in containers with an artificial gelatinous medium at the bottom and a lattice work so that they can separate from each other. These are at an early stage of development. Later on, they'll come out of the container. Bombyx mori, the caterpillar of the domestic silk moth, is the most widely used and intensively studied silkworm. Silk was believed to have been first produced in China as early as the Neolithic period. Today, China and India are the two main producers, with more than 60% of the world's annual production of silk. This is due to the fact that labor-intensive methods are used to raise silkworms. Unfortunately, the process of raising the worms has not been mechanized. Archaeological evidence points to silk cultivation as early as the Yangshao period. The Yangshao were a Neolithic culture that existed extensively along the Yellow River in China. It is dated from around 5000 to 3000 BC. The main food of these people was millet, though some evidence of rice has also been found. The Yangshao people kept pigs and dogs. Sheep, goats, and cattle are found much more rarely. So the domestication of a lepto lepidopteran, like the silkworm, is not an exception to the general rule. The Yangshao people domesticated other plants and animals. Archaeological silk fiber found on Indus civilization objects dates back to about 2450 to 2000 BC. It is believed that silk was being used and being grown over a wide area of South Asia. By about the first half of the first century AD, it had reached ancient Khotan. This is in western China. Khotan was the last Chinese stop in the Great Silk Road that stretched all the way to Europe, where silk from China would be transported overland into the European continent. In the 6th century AD, the smuggling of silkworm eggs into the Byzantine Empire, likely by Christian monks, led to its establishment in the Mediterranean, and this remained a monopoly, a very lucrative one, that the Byzantine Empire kept for centuries. They used silk objects for trade and for luxury goods that would win them friends and allies in many places. The monopoly was broken during the Second Crusade. In 1147, Roger II of Sicily, who ruled roughly 1095 to 1154, attacked Corinth and Thebes, two important centers of Byzantine silk production, of course in Greece. He captured the weavers and their equipment and established his own silk works in Palermo and Calabria in Italy. From there, this industry eventually spread into Western Europe. But before we go any further, we should probably go back to China. The discovery of silk, particularly. In China, one legend indicates the discovery of the silkworm silk was by a wife of the Yellow Emperor. According to the story, she was drinking tea under a tree when a silk cocoon fell into her tea. As she picked it out and started to unwrap the silk thread around her finger, she realized that the caterpillar larva was the source of the silk. This is a very interesting story, and of course, no one can be sure it's true, but the basis of it is interesting in that using warm water a silk cocoon can be unwrapped. The technology is not so difficult. The Chinese guarded their knowledge of silk and how to prepare 
the thread, and also how to weave fine fabric. But according to one story, a Chinese princess, given in marriage to a Khotan prince, brought to the oasis the secret of silk manufacture. Again, according to this story, she hid silkworms in her hair as part of her dowry. This was probably in the first half of the first century AD. It's notable that eggs are easily transported and that technology for making the thread is not so difficult. These things can be easily replicated in other places. And particularly if the local culture has dealt with other fibers, they can weave silk into fabric. But silk has a very long history in China, and there is more than one mythological account of silk. In Chinese mythology, the goddess of sericulture has been represented with a horse's head. The reasoning this would be so would be very obscure if not for a myth. According to the myth, a girl's father was forced into the army and sent far away. The girl missed her father and promised the family horse that she would marry him if the horse brought her father back home. The horse ran off and returned with the father, who, horrified at the idea of his daughter marrying a horse, killed it. Rather unfair considering what the horse did for the family. But it gets worse. The horse's skin was then hung up in the courtyard to dry for tanning. One day, when the daughter was in the courtyard, the wind blew and the horse hide wrapped around her. They both disappeared. Eventually, her father found out that she had been transformed into a silkworm and she was in a mulberry tree. This was the origin of the horse-headed lady, a goddess and the patroness of sericulture. It also explains why, to some degree, the head of a silkworm resembles the head of a horse, particularly the older stage larvae. Here one is reminded of Just So Stories for Little Children, a collection of origin stories by the British author Rudyard Kipling, first published in 1902. Just So Stories tell how particular animals were modified from their original forms to their current forms by the acts of humans or magical beings. For example, the whale has a tiny throat because he swallowed a mariner, who tied a raft inside to block the whale from swallowing other men. The camel has a hump given to him by a jinn, or a desert spirit, as punishment for the camels refusing to work. These stories draw upon a deep psychological need for the natural world to reflect a rational order. Indeed, the stories might be for children when compiled by Kipling, but all human beings have a need for order. Bombyx mandarina, the wild silk moth, is an insect from the moth family Bombycidae. It is the closest relative of the domestic silk moth, Bombyx mori. Unlike the domesticated relative, which is unable to fly and would not survive without human care, the wild silk moth is a fairly ordinary moth. It can take care of itself in the wild. Its main difference from the domesticated taxon is a more slender body with well-developed wings in males and a dull grayish-brown color. The origin of the domestic silk moth is enigmatic. It has been suggested that it is the survivor of an extinct species which diverged from the ancestors of Bombyx mandarina millions of years ago. However, this is based on a molecular clock that assumes that wild and domestic silk moths evolved equally fast after their lineages diverged. Instead, it is likely that artificial selection 
in other words, selection by humans, has accelerated the evolution in the domestic form to a point where it is hard to trace the origin of domestic silk moths. The wild species occurs over a considerable range from inland China to Korea and Japan and shows subtle variation over the range. Genetic evidence suggests the initial domestic stock came from inland China. B. mandarina is able to hybridize with Bombyx mori. Both in the wild and in a domesticated environment, females release pheromones and wait for males to be attracted and fly to them. However, in the domestic moth, B. mori, males cannot fly. Hybridization is possible in both directions in a domesticated environment controlled by humans. Today, it is usually recognized that the domestic silk moth is entirely dependent on human care for its survival and thus has a level of reproductive isolation from its wild relatives. Most people do regard it as a separate species. And in fact, the reason is fairly obvious, as here. The domestic silk moth, the worms being white, practically pop out of a background of their natural food plant, which is green. It's too enticing for a predator. And with humans, they're easily able to see and take care of the worms on their food plant, particularly transferring the worms from leaves when necessary, when the leaf dies, when the leaf dries out easy for humans to see, and also easy for predators to catch them. They are very dependent on humans. These late stage silkworm larvae have ceased to feed and are now looking for a place to spin their cocoons. Their bulbous heads do look something like a horse head, particularly when they rear up on their hindquarters. Mythology might not be so fantastic when appreciated in this light. This larva is in the process of spinning its cocoon. The silk it uses can be described something like hardened silkworm saliva. It comes out of the mouth, not out of the rear end, like in the case of a spider. When the silkworm ate mulberry leaves, these were digested and nutrients were sent into the bloodstream the silk glands absorb these nutrients. The larva has a small spinneret on its lip through which a single strand of silk emerges. This single strand of silk can be up to a mile long. The silkworm moves its head in figure eight patterns as it spins its cocoon. When the cocoon is only partially made, as here, you can see the larva moving around inside of it. Here are two silkworm pupae. This one has been cut completely out of the cocoon and the final shed skin is here. This one is a bigger example. It came from a bigger larva and the shed skin is here. The cocoon is here. Notice it's milky white color. The color of the silk filament can be determined by the diet of the larva as well as seasonal influences. Mulberry leaves produce the preferred lighter colored cocoons, but silkworms can also eat other plants and this results in a variety of colors being expressed in the cocoons. About the pupae, they might be a valid way of producing food on a large scale. About 80% of the world's nations eat insects. About 1,000 to 2,000 insect species are regularly eaten. In some societies, primarily Western nations, eating insects is uncommon or might even be considered a taboo. However, insects are a potential alternative protein source to conventional livestock like beef, chicken, or pork. Insects can be raised in large numbers 
and yield increased food security and might offer environmental and economic sustainability. Insect cultivation is a more efficient method of converting plant material into biomass than rearing traditional livestock. More than 10 times more plant material is needed to produce one kilogram of meat than one kilogram of insect biomass. Raising silkworms for silk production means that the pupa can be repurposed since the profit has already been obtained from the silk, the pupa can then be used as a dietary item. And since the silk worm pupa has been boiled, the pupa is already cooked. Bondigi, literally pupa, is a Korean street food made with silkworm pupae. It is usually sold from street vendors. The boiled or steamed snack food is served in paper cups with toothpick skewers. Canned bondagi can also be found in grocery stores and convenience stores throughout East Asia, though of course it goes under local names. There are a variety of different ways to prepare silkworm pupae. In Assam, boiled silkworm pupae are eaten directly with salt or fried with chili pepper or herbs as a snack or even as a main dish. In China, street vendors sell roasted silkworm pupae. In Japan, silkworms are usually served boiled in a sweet sour sauce made with soy sauce and sugar. In Vietnam and Thailand, roasted silkworm pupae can be sold at open markets. They are also sold as packaged snacks. Freeze-dried silkworm pupae can also be used to feed large fish like koi. They are high in protein, which contributes to rapid growth. Silkworms have been proposed for cultivation by astronauts and people in space stations as space food on long-term missions. The future of the silkworm is bright, particularly if it is harnessed as a food. However, there might be some difficulty in getting people to eat them. This moth has just emerged from its cocoon. Stability is extremely important while worms spin their cocoons. If they have started to spin their cocoons, if you make the slightest disturbance, unless the cocoon is almost finished, the silkworm will move and pick a brand new spot. The result is that there is usually space between one cocoon and another. Most breeders gather all the cocoons together. It can take anywhere from three to six weeks for the moths to emerge from their cocoons. Cocoons that are used for high-grade silk are baked in a hot oven to kill the pupae. The cocoons are then placed in boiling water to loosen the threads. A person finds the end of the thread and places it on a winding bobbin. Then a machine unrolls the cocoon, usually winding the silk from five cocoons together to make one silk thread. This thread can be woven into cloth. There are always some moths that do not emerge from their cocoons. The reason the thread is so tough. Cocoonase is a trypsin-like proteolytic enzyme produced by the larvae, by the pupae, as they near the final stages of their metamorphosis. It is produced by cells in the proboscis and exuded into the mouth parts. When a moth does successfully emerge, the first thing it might do is hang out on the cocoon until its wings fill with fluid, or it may wander around looking for a mate. It's very different from most wild type moths that need a vertical surface to inflate their wings. Because their wings are vestigial, the moth can be flat. Both males and females can flutter their vestigial wings, but they cannot fly. Males are more likely to wander around than females, but neither males nor females can fly. 
They can't eat and they can't drink. They mate, lay eggs, and die all within about five days. Females are significantly larger than the males. Once mated, the females can be placed on a paper on squares where they can lay their eggs. Each female will lay between 200 and 500 eggs. One ounce of silkworm eggs contains 40,000 eggs, or about 1,500 eggs per gram. These worms, when developed, will eat 3,500 pounds of mulberry leaves and will spin cocoons that will produce 18 pounds of silk thread. These are two male silkworm moths. You can tell that they're male from the brush-like antennae. After so many years of being cultivated, the domesticated Bombyx mori, the moth, as here, the silkworm and the pupa, are larger than its wild cousin, but they're rather feeble in comparison. There's an image here where the moth on the left is the domesticated paler larger moth and the one on the right is the wild type. As can be seen from the image and from the video, the moths have lost their pigments for the domestic silk moths. There's no need for camouflage because they're protected from predators by humans. They're used to being brought food. The caterpillar silk worm does not travel very far and it might die if it's, if it's not regularly brought new leaves. It digests more efficiently and grows more quickly, but the adult moths are very delicate, as here. However, it's hard to get them to react. They're incredibly docile. They're not scared, and they don't have a visible fear response. But before we go further, let's talk a little bit about moths in nature. The next are some clips of tobacco hornworm moths, aptly named hawk moths, just after emergence. As is clear, these hornworm moths require a surface from which they can hang and inflate their wings. They're excellent flyers, but once their wings are ready and they're flying, they require a lot of space to fly. They are not domesticated like the silkworm. Like these two males here, they don't require a vertical surface. They don't require inflating their wings. Their wings are rather vestigial and they're not able to fly. Very different from the hawk moth clips that will follow. This moth has just emerged from the pupal case and its wings are not yet inflated. The moth is looking for a vertical surface to crawl up. This moth is slowly inflating its wings with hemolymph. The moth is preparing for its first flight by exercising its wings. We just saw very large and vigorous tobacco hornworm moths. L like most other moths, both the tobacco hornworm moth and the silkworm moth are nocturnal. Being active at night means there's less competition for food and it's less likely that they're detected and eaten by things that feed during the day, like birds. Nocturnal moths evolved long before artificial lights. And some people will say that the invention of the electric light bulb led to the wholesale destruction of moth populations, particularly in urban areas. Humans have had a long relationship with light and humans have observed how moths go towards a flame. It's been a great mystery. But over time, scientists have learned that moths navigate by using distant celestial objects such as the moon and stars. 
They navigate by positioning themselves and flying at a fixed angle relative to these celestial light sources. If the position of the moon or stars is not obvious, moths instead can use geomagnetic signals. In other words, they can sense the Earth's magnetic field. It's not yet fully understood why moths appear attracted to bright lights, but there are several hypotheses. It could be that certain lights, like candles or light bulbs, emit specific wavelengths that attract moths. Another possibility is that artificial ultraviolet light associated with a food source, like night blooming flowers, is replicated in these other sources of light, like a candle flame or an electric light bulb. However, this isn't necessarily how moths seek out these flowers. These flowers also release high levels of carbon dioxide, or CO2, at night. Moths can detect these CO2 emissions and use them to find flowers. The leading idea is that moths use starlight to accurately fly straight over long distances. There's an image here of a moth moving in a circle towards a flame, and it's keeping a constant frame of reference. By maintaining this constant angle towards an object like the moon or stars, moths can fly in a straight line. Because the moon and stars are so far away, the change in the light's angle is negligible. But when a moth flies towards a close-up artificial light, the angle changes dramatically. In other words, evolutionarily, a moth is not equipped to deal with the challenges of an electric light bulb or a single candle flame. In these cases, the moth thinks that the artificial light is a star or the moon, and the moth keeps changing its flight angle to, to keep going in a straight line it keeping a constant frame of reference. The changes mean the moth continually turns towards the light, causing it to spiral and circle around the light source instead of flying straight. So there are very good reasons why silkworms cannot fly. Humans, of course, need light to see, and they've been masters of light for a very long time. Long before the electric light bulb, they used oil lamps, which would have been deadly to moths that could fly. Moths that could fly require a lot of specialized care, would require an enclosed cage, and they would also require uh, being separated from light. The domestic Bombyx mori, not being able to fly, is not tempted by light, although it's active at night. This is a relationship that has served both moths and humans very well for perhaps several thousand years, and hopefully it will serve these two species well into the future, maybe another few thousand years. Thank you very much for your attention.